Okay, sounds good. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome my very first speech pathologist on the show. And she happens to be from Harvard. Nice. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I got really blessed in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact she reached out to me too. So how about that? I mean, it's amazing. Her name is Rebecca Rowland. Now, for those of you that don't know who she is, she's a lecturer at Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education, and she serves on the faculty at Harvard Medical School as well. So she probably keeps her very, very busy. She's also an oral and written language specialist in the neurology department of Boston Children's Hospital. My goodness, I'm I'm like, yeah, well. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a long list. <laughs> so many amazing things that you do, Rebecca. And you got a brand new book out, which is called The Art of Talking with Children. I love that title and all the things that are in this book are going to be very, very helpful for a lot of people, especially parents and those soon-to-be parents like myself, hopefully yeah. one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> are you also a mum as well, Rebecca? Can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Oh, thanks so much. I'm really excited. Thank you so much for number one, reaching out to me and number two, for making a time to be here. I know it is relatively late for you in Boston. I believe you're in Boston. Yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. Amazing. I'm kind of jealous of you, the fact that you are in Boston. <laughs> but uh, before we dive further into your backstory, why you do what you do, and more specifically, the art of talking with children, my very first question for you, now you've kind of cheated and you've listened to some of my podcasts, so you know the kind of question. We've had some time to prepare, I, I hope. <laughs> yes. um, but what does success look like for you? So yes, I think success for me is all about authenticity, um, just really having strong relationships with people, being who you really are and supporting other people to really thrive in who they are as well. When was the moment for you that you realized that was success? Um, I think actually being with my kids and realizing that you really don't need anything fancy. It almost doesn't matter how big your house is or how much you have. If you're able to really sit and enjoy each other's company, that to me is success. This idea of authenticity, right? Like not a lot of people, I think a lot of people these days, they kind of struggle with being more authentic with wholeheartedly within themselves. I guess what does or what's your version of authenticity? Yes. And for me, actually, it's a little counterintuitive because I don't think it's all about putting all of yourself out there. I think some people think like, I'm authentic. I'm going to just, you know, put everything about me out there. And that's, that's who I am. I think really it is more about being intentional and kind of mindful about, well, what parts of yourself do you want to share when and recognizing that you can be multiple people to multiple, you know, multiple audiences. You don't always have to be, um, you know, all out there if you don't want to be. You mentioned your kids, like seeing your kids authentic and then they're the ones that actually taught you. Are all kids like that? Are all kids just purely authentic growing up? Or, and, and do we have it like weaned out of us? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I would say I think there's a tendency. I think kids are um, oftentimes, you know, they are saying what they think. They are, you know, expressing their personality more authentically um, until they're tamped down and told, you know, oh, you shouldn't do that or boys don't cry or you don't do that, you know, then they are starting to tamp down, you know, what's their authentic expression. But yeah, I think we can learn a lot from children. I saw a, I totally agree with you on that fact. And we'll dive further into that uh, point in just a moment. But I saw a kid, I think it was yesterday, actually, he had literally no fear whatsoever. I think he might have been one or two years old. But we've got a German Shepherd dog that we took down to the cafe. And the moment this kid saw the dog, he started running up to towards her. He goes, oh, doggy, doggy. And, and I'm like, you are really, really brave, mate. <laughs> yeah, really. And the mom's like, yeah, literally no fear whatsoever. Yeah. But I, I was just like impressed by how this kid was just being wholeheartedly himself with no fear whatsoever. And it kind of reminded me of me a little bit back in the day. Mm -hmm. It's like kids are smart. Yeah. And I feel like society is sort of like, making them less smart, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Am I I'm on the right track with that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think so. I think, um, I mean, obviously we want to keep kids from real dangers, but I think on the one hand, yeah, we do ask a ton of questions, especially I think that suggests that there is this one right answer that we're kind of like looking for something from them. And we don't always take the time to hear their ideas, which are often much cooler than the ideas that we came in with. Uh, so I totally agree. What sort of sparked your interest in being a speech pathologist first and foremost and studying like this art of actually talking to kids because it really is an art 
For sure. Yeah. So it's actually funny. I started out even in high school and in college, I was really interested in poetry and I'm a poet. I write poems and publish books of poems and write fiction as well. And so for me, language is something that's always been really fascinating. Um, and so once I started playing around with language, then I started actually interacting more as a teacher I realized, well, actually the language of people communicating is really fascinating. So it's not just the language on the page, but actually the language of everyday life. You know, if you go to a cafe and you listen, like how are people actually talking to each other? Um, for me, that was just a really fascinating thing to do. I think it was a fiction exercise I was given once, just actually go to a cafe, sit and write down what people are actually saying. Uh, and you'd be amazed, you know, you think you know, or you think you might know, but actually when you get down to it, people are having these really interesting conversations all the time and expressing themselves in really interesting ways. Let's dive further into language because this is something that has fascinated me for a long time. And, you know, like language is really, really important for communicating certain ideas and beliefs and, and whatnot. We have our own sort of inner dialogue to in, in a language of listening and listening to ourselves. So what is it most, how do we become better communicators first and foremost? Like how is that even possible? Are we able to drill down the, the nitty gritty things? <laughs> the, the sure. Yeah. So um, definitely. So I actually talk about what I call rich talk. Um, so this idea of um, these more meaningful conversations and really thinking about it as having, I talk about the ABC. So there's kind of these three components um, one being that it's really adaptive. So you're actually tailoring whatever you're saying to the situation, to the person in front of you. You're not just, you know, it's not a one size fits all. You really are thinking, well, you know, how old is this person? What are their beliefs? What are their thoughts? You know, you're kind of adapting to that person. Um, and B is a back and forth. So you're actually not just saying, well, let me come in with my perspective, but you're taking the time to really have that balance, you know, and seeing are you more of a listener? Are you more of a talker? And how can you actually balance that in a way that lets the other person feel heard and seen also? Um, and see, for at least for talking with kids, is child-driven. So you're actually starting with just paying attention. It's only about mindfulness in the sense of what is on this child's mind? You know, is it something they want to share? Is it something that's stressing them out? Um, and I think by actually just focusing there and being thoughtful, just sitting for a moment, you'll get so much more than if you come in kind of, you know, wanting to railroad your own ideas. So it's being authentically present and genuinely interested in that person. Exactly. I think it comes down to that. <laughs> wow. Okay. And that's, do you think that's more of a skill that we can learn or is it naturally within us to do that? Yeah, I definitely think it's a skill we can learn. I mean, I do think that, you know, that's why it is an art. I think that there is no one, you know, I, I lay out a big framework, but obviously every person has their strengths and their skills as communicators. Um, and so I think whatever you are already good at, it's good to build that up. And whatever's weaker for you, it's good to also work on that. And I think that we can all become better at this. Have you looked at the different forms of communication, the different ways we convey topics and ideas and, and like personality traits, that sort of thing? Definitely. Yeah. So I think about a lot about temperament. So there's one chapter in my book about, you know, temperament only, which is really just the idea of, you know, are you more active? Are you more, um, you know, easy to startle kind of what traits, you know, do you bring to a situation? And that may be for a kid, but it's for all of us. We all have our own temperaments. Um, I also look at other aspects of um, communication. So things like gesture, body language, tone of voice. So it's not only the words we're saying, obviously, but there's so much more to it. And I think so much more that we don't always pay attention to. But not all of us are speech pathologists. Did you find that you ended up learning more about this being a speech pathologist or would you do your own research on this growing up? Yeah, I actually learned more about it being a speech pathologist. And then actually when I became a parent, I realized what was kind of funny is that there was so much we knew and that I had learned about language, but that wasn't really translating to my parenting life or to other people's parenting lives that I saw. Um, so that's where I kind of found this big gap where thinking, oh, we actually know so much about language. We know so much about what's you know possible to do with it, but then we're not really very intentional. We're kind of on autopilot. And I was very much so myself. This may be like a very, is more my curiosity here, but mm -hmm. Are kids better at communicating more than adults? I think they're different. I think that they have oftentimes their own way of thinking, their own way of working, and kind of 
oftentimes you see kids on the playground, for example, who are good friends and their language, they've almost developed their own little language that can make little sense to somebody who's outside of them. You know, they might say like five Pokemon or cards or six, you know, and, and you come in and you think like, I have no idea what's happening here because they really do often develop. If we give them the time, um, they often develop their own little communities and their shared language systems. Um, and so I think that's what's so powerful about actually giving children time to play together because they are able to bounce things off each other and develop in a way that they don't always when they're talking with us. What were you like growing up as a kid in terms of communication? Well, that's a good question. Actually, I was very shy, I would say, as a child. Um, I think even um, I was very introverted. I love reading and writing. Um, I think maybe that's partly what led me to study all of this because I realized I wanted to communicate with people, but I really was very nervous about it, I would say. And so uh, actually, it was funny because as a speech pathologist, um, part of my training involved working with a patient, um, sometimes who had aphasia or word finding disorder. Um, and my supervisor would come in and write down afterwards, everything she thought that went well. And then everything she thought that didn't go so well. (laughs) And actually it was incredibly stressful for me at the time. Um, but I think it was almost sort of like boot camp because afterwards I just felt really almost liberated and feeling like as if someone could critique me and I didn't really mind, you know, so they might say, well, I really thought you could say this differently. And I would say, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe I could do that. Um, so I think that actually having that kind of feedback, um, and even giving not maybe that intense, but having some sort of feedback can be so helpful in, um, just helping us nudge us towards, uh, you know, a richer communication style. This may be an even more personal question for you, but do you still struggle with communication today? Um, I would say it's really funny because I, I love public speaking now, I would say like I, in almost like more people, the better, I just really find it so interesting to engage with audiences, but I would say that at the same time, I still am fundamentally introverted. Yeah. So even though I really love it, I find that once I'm done, I'm just like, oh, I'm totally, I'm tired. I want to go read and read a book. Um, so I think some people aren't that way. And I think I'll probably always be that way because I think that's an aspect of my temperament. Um, But what's nice is that I have come to enjoy the process. um, Whereas before it was just stressful. I'm very much like you in the sense that I'm naturally introverted. I like my quiet time, but I do have my moments of extroversion (laughs) where I do talk an arm off a a leg off a chair, that sort of thing. I I can do that. And I think that I, I sort of have to reel myself back in a little bit and say mm-hmm. like, whoa, I'll do right, right. <laughs> too much. <laughs> exactly. I'm sort of like gauging uh, I, if, if it's my guest or uh, one of my friends, I see their facial expressions mm-hmm. and if they're like looking around or they're not really paying much attention, then I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm probably talking too much. Too much. <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I know. I have that tendency too. I'd say now I'm more on the side of talkative rather than, than listening. So something I can work on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think for for me, I think it's about building a little, a little bit more sense of confidence to be able to speak a little bit more, which kind of like, kind of good segue into my next question, actually. <laughs> if someone is struggling to build that sense of confidence to communicate with a, a large group of people, how would we help them? Like, what are the, some of the foundational steps to build up to that confidence to actually communicate properly with a large group of people? Yeah. So I would say oftentimes someone who's in that situation, they've been getting either negative feedback from someone else or even just negative feedback from themselves. They might have experiences where, oh, this was hard for me or it didn't go well. And so what you want to do, I would say, is really start with what is already going well, what they're already good at or strong at. And that could be a couple of things. It could be sort of the content. So have them start with something, talking about something that they actually enjoy, that they're actually interested in, because then their natural passion for it, it tends to come across more. Um, And then also start practicing by either talking it out with a friend or pretending you're with a friend. So rather than feeling like, oh, here's, imagine this audience of people, you know, just imagine you're with this one friend and try to talk about this interesting subject. And so you can try to feel confidence and build confidence in those small ways, because probably naturally that will come easier. Um, And then gradually over time, we work on kind of your self-talk so that you can actually see, okay, well, you actually did do a good job with that, you know? And so how can you build on that more? 
Is that the same design for kids as well? Yes. I mean, it's very similar because I think oftentimes kids also are very um, self-aware and very critical of themselves if they feel like they're not good speakers. Um, So I encourage schools, especially to start very young. Um, Even I've seen four and five-year-olds who can get up in front of their class and they encourage each child to um, act out a story, tell a story, or, you know, um, actually in my son's preschool class, they have each child tell a story, they write it down, and then the child and some friends act it out in front of the class, Um, which I think is really great because, you know, you're sort of showing that, okay, I can come up with these ideas and then I can perform at a very young age. And so that's kind of breaking before a lot of kids have gotten into that negative self-talk about performance or talking in front of people. If you can start early, you can oftentimes kind of cut that off at the pass. And what if say that young kid or even an adult doesn't like the way that their voice actually sounds. This is something that has fascinated me for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, it's interesting. And actually one thing to keep in mind, I think that's important to talk with kids and adults about is that we oftentimes don't recognize how we sound on the phone or on, on audio <laughs> on TV or something like that. So we often sound different than we sound in our own heads. So I think to recognize and normalize that, that for everyone, they sound different um, than they sound in their heads, that can make people a little bit less freaked out because sometimes I think it is just a sense of like, oh, that doesn't sound like me, you know, and that can feel upsetting. (laughs) Um, So to realize, okay, well, that's a normal thing. And then if they still really don't like the way they sound, I do actually talk through, well, what aspects of it do you not like? And let's see if we can modify some of those. So oftentimes, especially people who are uncertain, you know, they have the tendency to answer by always raising their voice at the end, you know, because because they're always, you know, as if they're asking a question, like, I think it went well, you know, that kind of thing. So we work on like, well, actually, let's think about how you can just more intentionally not end every sentence as if it's a question. So there are things like that, that you can modify. And I think can be really helpful in just having people feel more comfortable. This is, yeah, like I said, very interesting for me because for the longest time and even still to this day, I struggle with hearing my own voice. And it's funny because I'm doing a podcast and I'm listening. <laughs> yes, to I was just thinking that. <laughs> talk all the time. It's just the, 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 the um, what's the word? Uh, the irony in that. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's quite funny. But why is it that, say, for example, why is it that some people don't like the way they sound? Is it because of that negative personal feedback or what constitutes like, for example, what constitutes someone loving their voice in the first place? Yeah. I mean, I think there are a couple of things. I think one thing is um, you have a certain image of yourself and we all do. And if you hear yourself and it doesn't correspond with that image, it can feel very unsettling. So for example, if you feel, Oh, I'm a really funny person. But then when you hear yourself, you don't sound very funny or you you don't sound as funny in the right way. Then it feels like, oh, you know, I don't I don't like that. Um, Some people have a different issue. Like I know several women who are professors, but they have really high voices naturally. So when they come across on a phone or in a podcast, they sound very, very young, uh, you know, because it's like, oh, you thought you were 15, you know, and, um, and so that can feel really difficult as well. So I think it often has to do with um, kind of that cycle of you don't think you sound good. And so you play more into that and then you feel even worse about it and you may perform worse. So we want to start with both the self-talk, but then also if there are small things to modify so you can self-talk and improve and on and on. What's the best voice that you've ever heard? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I really like Werner Herzog's voice. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Can't go wrong that's with That's really Herzog. good. Yeah, I think it's really amazing. Just like whatever he will say, I'll just kind of listen to it. <laughs> so. I mean, I, yeah, I like Werner Herzog. Um, I think for me listening to, there's an English actor, Ian McShane. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you know his voice, but it's very iconic. I mean, mm-hmm. I could listen to him talk. It'd be like on my, on my sleep thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> to be honest, it's just so cool. But firstly, I guess if we were to look at the science of looking at why is it that we like certain voices more than others, what is the science behind that? Is there any? 
Yeah, so it definitely is. And it's interesting. It's almost like um, if you think about there's research also on um, faces, why we find some faces huh. more beautiful than others. Um, and oftentimes it has to do with symmetry. So things like actually, <laughs> which is funny, like, if you, yeah, if you have sort of like symmetrical eye shape and symmetrical, et cetera, then people tend to think of you as more attractive than if there are asymmetries. Um, and similarly with voices, it often has to do with what's known as resonance. So kind of how much the voice is even, and then also how much it's kind of vibrating um, in the space. Huh. So for example, Werner Herzog, I would say has a very resonant voice. It's very deep and it kind of, um, if you actually just study it scientifically, I would think it probably is very even. Um, if you have someone who has say a very grainy voice or gritty, almost if, you know, the sort of typical sm long-term smoker type voice, oftentimes you see a lot of, um, jitter, they call it. Um, so it actually means like it's moving all around, um, the, the sound. And so that doesn't come across often as smooth as the other voices. So it's actually, it's a fascinating subject if you're, uh, if you want to go into it. I, I am fascinated by this. Like how, cause when we're kids, our voice is different as kids. And then we go through the stage of puberty and then our voice cracks. Right. <laughs> and then, we, voice. Then, then it changes again. Like I, I was comfortable with my my young <laughs> young voice and then all of a sudden I sound like this now. Yeah. <laughs> like what happened? What happened, yes, Rebecca? Yes. I know, I know. And it's funny because, um, you know, we think about that for boys, especially, or men. Um, but uh, we actually know that women's or girls and women's voices change also, um, but just less dramatically. So they often don't crack in that same way um because they're not going you know such a dramatic change but also yeah both genders have voices that change so it's it's an interesting phenomenon and, and funny how you either get used to or don't really get used to your the older version of yourself <laughs> so it's mainly because is it the adam's apple the the mm -hmm. the esophagus that's changing as we're growing older mm -hmm. Yes, in part, there are like physiological changes. Yeah. So like the structures, the, you know, vocal cords um, lengthen, like the Adam's apple develops and yeah, and all of that. And I think it changes um, the way you end up sounding. And smoking just makes it... Yeah. <laughs> it just damages yeah it. i mean it damages like any kind of damage so whether you you often smoking is one but you'll even hear it with um singers who have been you know singing really loudly so any kind of like vocal damage comes across as what we call vocal fry so it's almost like your voice sounds fried um in that way and um and so it doesn't often sound to the you know lay person's ear it doesn't sound as sort of fluid and um lovely to listen to as someone whose voice doesn't feel as damaged i've always wanted to ask this but can everyone sing <laughs> in the shower <laughs> <laughs> with the nice ambience yeah. yes <laughs> no one's actually, listening. <laughs> yeah yeah no but actually it's really funny because people's voices do sound better in the shower, uh, which is really interesting. Some people, you would say, oh, I sound better in the shower. It's true um, because actually it's almost like a sound booth. So your voice actually resonates better um, in the shower than it does just in, you know, regular air. So it's it's actually funny because you may find that you, you do sound better in the shower. Um, but I do think, yes, every, I mean, every, there's always a range. So some people do have more of that sort of perfect pitch where they're able to hit notes almost without even thinking about it. Um, for other people, they don't have that. But I would say that um, most people are much more critical of themselves than they should be about their singing voices and that most people can sing quite well if they're given a little bit of training and a little encouragement. Well, I'm the exception to that. <laughs> I've tried, believe you. Yes, many, it doesn't work. Times. I just, yeah, no, nah, it's not working no, for me. No, but I, I, mean, I always yeah. find it interesting, Rebecca, how some people have got like really, really hoarse and coarse voices and then you get them singing and they, they just sound really really clear it's beautiful i'm just like what's going on there like how yeah, does that yeah. work yeah yeah that's it's amazing i mean sometimes people's so much changes actually when you're singing um and one thing that always fascinates me i don't know if you know about this research also but is that people oftentimes with alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia Huh. can remember songs incredibly well, especially songs from their youth or happy birthday or things like that. And they can actually, even if they're not able to speak, there has been some really fascinating research on the fact that they can often sing um, many songs and actually communicate through that kind of musical, you know, back and forth um, when they feel otherwise just really unable to talk. So I think that the power of music is just really incredible. 
music therapy, I think. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's a line of thought. Mm-hmm. I used to look after a young disabled girl and she she couldn't really speak that well. But then when you played Katy Perry songs, she <laughs> used to dance to it and she used to actually <laughs> sing some of the words. Oh, wow. It was, it was fascinating to actually see it happen. But the moment you don't, it just go back to not even forming sentences. It'd just be like this one word or sounds, right? Like, and it's just like, yeah, it was very interesting to see how that that worked for her and how music played an important role in that. So, I mean, if someone was struggling with firstly communication and voice, like being out, I think you mentioned, is it Alphasia? Alphasia. Alphasia. Alphasia, Alphasia, Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. If someone's got that, how long does it normally take to get them to the stage where they actually can form proper sentences? Is that actually possible? Um, It is possible. That was actually the first place I did my clinical kind of outplacement work. Um, And we actually did actually, it's funny because we did some kind of musical intonation therapy where you actually do work, not necessarily singing full songs, although some people did, but even just making words sound more musical. So you almost sing phrases um, and help them practice singing phrases, um, which actually can be really effective for some people. Um, What's hard though, is that aphasia has so, there's such a broad spectrum And there's actually two kinds, sort of two general types, Um, one in which people have a lot of trouble speaking any anything at all. It's called Broca's aphasia. And Mm -hmm. one is called Wernicke's aphasia, which is just where people often speak a lot, but it sounds like a jumble. It's it's almost like a foreign language. There are no actual or very few actual words. Um, And so depending on the kind of aphasia a person has and how severe it is, that's all going to you know, it's going to change how long it takes. It's kind of like saying you have a broken leg. It's like, well, how broken is it? You know, and how many pieces and how severe, you know, all of that would change how long your leg would take to heal. Let's determine the damage. So to see exactly. How, yeah. How we can yeah. Heal it. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask before we dive into your book, I, I am mindful of the time, but <laughs> it, it, I'm just enjoying this conversation immensely. Um, can we critique my voice? <laughs> I always wanted to do this from a speech pathology standpoint. One of my friends, she's actually a speech pathologist and I keep asking her, she'll attest to this if she ends up listening to it. I'll probably send it to her and say, hey, look, listen to this. Um, but she keeps saying that my voice is fine. Now, for my own gratification, my own pride and ego standpoint, <laughs> I'm going to ask someone that's Harvard trained how is my voice? Is it, is it acceptable, sustainable? That's <laughs> the right words. Yes. I mean, I, I think your voice sounds great. I think it's, um, yeah, it's very, it's resonant. I think it comes across very well and on radio or on the audio. Um, I think obviously we have two different accents. So I think I enjoy hearing accents that are different, especially as the vowels are different. So I sort of noticed that. Um, but I think that's obviously that's great. Um, so I don't, be any problem i don't really see anything to critique about your voice but uh yeah i'd be curious what what issues you have with your voice I, <laughs> I just not too personal yeah, the way the way i sound um, i think i just have this like level of expectation that i want to mm-hmm. sound like but i don't mm-hmm. sound like it <laughs> so i think i'm like projecting this this voice and then i hear it back and i'm like mm-hmm. oh i sound I sound ridiculous. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's just maybe that's just me. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I think I I try not to listen. I think that might help. I don't know if you're obviously running a podcast, you may need to listen. But um, for me, I I think that's a very common thing to feel, and I would almost just encourage you to realize that that is something a lot of people feel and may not have a lot of basis in reality. Um, but just to, just to feel that it's okay, and if you don't like your voice. Try not to listen to it. <laughs> That's my solution. That's a good solution, actually. I'm, I'm going to try and do that. It's going to be very difficult, but yes, <laughs> I'm going to try. Okay, now that I've gotten that ego part, I, sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable. Oh, no, that's, that's great. In, I, I have no no taboos. So it's fine. In, in, re, in real time. <laughs> yes. Let, let's get to the topic of your book, The Art of Talking with Children. Why did you decide to write a book? with this and what were some of the, the criteria you came up with 
And how long did it take you to write the book? Three questions in one. There we go. <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, yeah, yes, actually the book is a combination kind of a memoir and a guidebook. So it is drawn from my life as a mother of two, as well as a speech pathologist and lecturer. Um, and I actually wrote the book because I was sitting with my husband one night um, after we'd put the kids to bed and we had a very busy weekend. And I said to him, you know, I'm just curious, like I was thinking about what we had talked about this weekend, I actually have no idea. Like I know I could list like 15 things we did this weekend. And I don't even know a single thing we actually talked about. And I was like, what did we talk about? And he looked at me for a minute. He was like, oh, I actually have no idea either. I have no idea what we talked about. <laughs> uh, and I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy. Especially because like, I am a speech pathologist. Like I focus on language. You think I would, you know, keep a little bit of attention to that. Um, and I realized I actually hadn't, that we were so busy. I was so kind of focused on all the things we were doing that I actually didn't pay any attention almost at all, you know, aside from saying, well, let me not be yelling at my children or something, but I was not at all very intentional about it. And I started wondering, is this something that's very common? Um, so I reached out to some other parents and some other speech pathologists. And I realized that when I was asking people, you know, what do you talk with your kids about? Or what did you talk about yesterday? It was very similar. So we just really mm -hmm. don't focus on what we actually say, how we're saying it, what our kids are saying, kind of that everyday conversation just takes a real backseat. Um, and at the same time, I was learning so much about how much conversation can do for kids. So actually, you know, the power of it. But then I was realizing, well, this is really ironic because as a person who specializes in language, I wasn't doing very much about it. So that really led me on this journey, um, which took uh, a couple of years, I would say, at least <laughs> to, to write. If you've got a difficult child that you want to sort of let them know that, hey, this is not acceptable, what is the best way to convey that to a child? Yes. I mean, I think um, it depends on the child's age, I would say. Um, but I would actually argue against just saying, okay, no, stop doing that. And unless it's something that's very dangerous, like obviously they're running into the street. You want, you say, no, stop doing that. And you, you, you know, hold their hand, you run after them, you grab them, you do whatever you have to do. So that's not what I'm talking about. Um, but if there is something that's just, you know, frustrating, annoying, but not very dangerous, I would actually just look and sit with the child and try to figure out, well, what is he or she getting out of the situation? What is the motivation? Why are they doing it? Um, I actually gave an example in the book once of my son, I think, who was pulling out all of the toilet paper off the roll. And this is his <laughs> habit. So he would go into the bathroom soon after he was potty trained and you'd be like, are you OK? He's like, I'm OK. You know, but then like you would get in there five minutes later and all the toilet paper would be in this like huge pile on the floor. And I was like, no, like you just you can't do that. And I would say to him, like, no, we don't pull toilet paper off the roll. But then I was thinking like, well, what is it about the situation that he really likes? And I realized he really was fascinated, as annoying as it was to me, with figuring out like what was at the end of this toilet paper roll, you know? And so he wanted to do this, but it wasn't really about making a mess. So I oftentimes think, you know, it's triggering for us. So we get really angry, but it's actually wasn't, the intention wasn't to anger me. Like the intention yeah. was actually a curiosity, which is just like, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I did this. And kids are often thinking that. So they're often having these curiosities that we then are triggered when they make a mess or they're annoying. But if we weren't so triggered, we could find another way for them to get that without necessarily having to irritate us. So in that case, I was like, well, what else could he pull and find the end of? Like, let's find some other things he can do. And obviously, yes, you say, well, we don't do this. We don't pull all the toilet paper off. But here's something else you could do that might satisfy that curiosity. Um, and I think that that kind of shift can be really helpful, especially when, you know, we are kind of stuck in this cycle. Mm. Speaking about curiosity, I mean, fostering that in a child, I think, is crucial to the development, that sort of thing. But did curiosity ever kill the cat, in your opinion? <laughs> Um, yes. I mean, do you mean like you can be too curious and yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think at some point, yes. Like I think there's a, there, you know, there's a sense in which I have some parents and teachers, you know, who say like, oh, you just like, we could just have a school. And I know that some schools like this exist where, you know, kids can just literally follow their curiosity all day, every day, and that they don't necessarily 
you know, need to sit with a book if they don't like to, or they don't need to, you know, they just, they do what they are interested in. And I do think that has its downsides for sure. Um, I think there's some things as a speech pathologist, I focus on reading and writing also. And you really do, for the most part, um, need some kind of instruction <laughs> to learn how to read and write. And so if you don't like it, the problem is then you don't do it and then you, you don't get better, and then you really don't like it. Um, so I do think there is value in helping a child find areas of interest within kind of larger activities. Um, but always, I do think, still focusing on the curiosity of the child. So you can still teach writing with something the child is interested in, you know, but you want to teach it, but still go towards the curiosity. So I don't think you can ever really be too curious, but you know, you need some guidance sometimes, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you on that front. Like I say in, in my book, because I was very much a curious child. I was always asking questions, annoying the living daylights out of adults. Uh, it's hard to believe that they actually answered some of the questions and the wild <laughs> things that I, I used to come up with. Uh, but I said that these days, curiosity is being taken away from young kids with technology, with all these other aspects and they're more afraid than ever to ask questions so i'm like curiosity never hurt anyone important or good mm -hmm. it was the fact that they were curious that they became important in the first place exactly that, that curiosity we need it in order to be proper human beings so that we can have proper conversations with people and that's an art form into itself like that we need to just yeah like you said foster it has some structure around it for sure, but at times let the kids' brains run a little bit wild. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's so funny because I think we don't always think about people like people like Einstein, you know, people like um, you know, Thomas Edison. We don't mm. we see what they did, we think of them as great scientists, but we don't always think about the fact that they were oftentimes just staring at things, thinking about them, <laughs> you know, like Einstein would like, you know, stare at the water running and a lake or a, a river and say like, oh, I'm wondering about how all this is moving or, you know, so, so many great discoveries actually come from people just sitting oftentimes in nature and just looking and thinking about things. Um, we don't always see that when we see kind of the great scientists or the great thinkers, but I think we should. It's like Picasso or Mozart looking at either music or a blank canvas, like the page, right? So it's just exactly. sitting there thinking and letting the brain run wild. Uh, a friend of mine calls it mind wandering. Mm -hmm. And that also helps Definitely. us focus as well, which in turn affects our communication. How we, I mean, if we've got nothing to talk about, sometimes we need that little, exactly. little bit of a kick. <laughs> to, exactly. To think about something completely random. Say it. Mm -hmm. It's better than saying right. nothing sometimes, in my exactly. opinion. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's if we want, we don't want that awkwardness, but sometimes we should have it. But anyway, I'm going off on a tangent again, Rebecca, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the hardest thing about you writing this book? I would say actually that I wrote it, I started writing it before the pandemic started. Um, and then I finished writing it in the middle of the pandemic. And so I actually was with my children a lot of the time while writing a book about the art of talking with children. <laughs> and so it really, um, it was very difficult in the sense that I was doing a lot of the multitasking that parents are doing, um, you know, helping with math while trying to write emails and so on. Um, but it actually really checked me and I think made my book much more realistic um, because I was really thinking every day, you know, what actually is possible here? What actually is helpful here? Um, and I wasn't really in an ivory tower. I wasn't in an office. You know, I was really just there um, kind of really thinking and working it out. But it was it was challenging at the time for sure. Where do you want people to get a copy of this book if they're in the US or even in Australia? I know we've got different bookshops, but where primarily do you want them to go? Um, well, they can go, they can find links on my website. So it's probably the easiest place. Um, it's just Rebecca Roland with two C's and two L's.com. Um, they can also go to HarperCollins, the publisher, and they have um, copies in various <laughs> locations. Um, there's also Amazon. If you are, um, if you are linked to Amazon, that's, that will work as well. And you can follow her on LinkedIn as well. She posts some pretty interesting content I've noticed and I like it. Thank you. <laughs> it just spurs on my curiosity. You've got some different articles there. So if you are interested in following Rebecca, I'll make sure that the link to her book is below in the show notes as well as 
uh, where you can find more about her website, you name it. Uh, Rebecca, I've got two quick final questions for you, if you don't mind. Like I said, I could probably speak to you for ages. <laughs> no, thank <laughs> uh, you. I may have to do a part two when I get over to the States, who knows? Definitely. But um, what do you love the most about yourself and your story? Um, I think I love the fact that it's not just one story. So I think the fact that I've managed without, without even meaning to necessarily, but I think to blend my interest in creativity and writing and language, um, with my work with children, I really had thought of it as two separate things. Like I'm a writer. And then I also am a speech pathologist. And I think for this book and this project, it's made me feel like those things are really integrated. I like that. This is my, uh, my final question. If you got to the end of my, my other podcast, then I think Mm -hmm. You're prepared for this question too, but it's a hypothetical one. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument, but they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? That's a great question. <laughs> I would say, um, I think that I lived a life that encouraged people to really express who they are and that d- I did the best to express who I was as well. And that, and that actually is the best way of caring for people um, that actually enabled to help people really feel comfortable being who they are and feel proud and able to celebrate that is actually a form of, um, of care. And I think that's something that we don't always see. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for your time today, your stories, your wisdom, your advice. Really, really enjoy this conversation. You're welcome back anytime. Oh, thank, thank you. you so I enjoyed it as well. <laughs> on the Storybox podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.